Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to Divine Allegiance. I'm your host, Mona Beg. And uh, this is the month of Shaban and we are past 15th Shaban. Well, today it might be the 15th of Shaban and when we air this show. But uh, we are discussing regarding Imam Mahdi. And I uh, just want to get to some questions right now because uh, this uh, series that we are doing regarding Imam Mahdi has been well received and a lot of youngsters who are watching uh, they have questions so let me get to some of these questions and we'll uh, explain these things um, or what we are talking about in detail I want to get to those questions we are talking about the conditions of the appearance of Imam Mahdi what are the things that need to happen for the Imam to come back, meaning that Imam's reappearance depends on these things. So first of all, I mentioned regarding the Ummat, the followers, meaning the followers have to be ready. And the followers, we went through that, what they have to do, the most important thing that has been mentioned in Hadith also and in the advice of Imam Mahdi himself to his Shias is that the Shias, the core group of helpers of the Imam, must come together and truly start loving each other. It's not about unity, it's more than unity. It's about love and that is what we spoke about and I did speak about that. It's an emphasis that all of you out there must try to emphasize everywhere. All the people that you talk to, every group that you on, you got to raise the issue that, you know, the most important focus for us is that we need to be together and we need to be together strongly. So we went through that and now uh, the second condition I raised that issue is about the Imam and recognizing the Imam, who the Imam is. And there is a simplistic, simple-minded understanding of the Imam that we learn in Sunday schools which is not going to be enough for you to join the Imam or to recognize him or to be with him. If you want to join the Imam or if you want to recognize him or be with him, that knowledge or information regarding Imam Mahdi is not enough, which says, where is he from? Who is his father? Who is his mother? Where, is, uh, where did he disappear? These things are really irrelevant when it comes to the marifat of the Imams. Marifat of the Imams really means a study of who and what they are and what they stand for. What is, what is the, truly, what are they about? When you look at that person, what he's about, and you understand that, and the more you understand that, the more uh, recognition you have. And this recognition or ma'rifat, that's the term used in hadith. The term ma'rifat means you recognize someone, to know someone well, what they stand for, who they are. That is ma'rifat that we are talking about. And that ma'rifat is necessary for the Shias. They must increase their ma'rifat. Know the Imam really well before he comes in order for them to be with him. The problem that happens when a person doesn't know the Imam is that when the Imam comes, he might have a problem accepting him if he doesn't know who he is. Really, if you don't know who he is, you'll have a problem accepting him. Let's say the Imam is there. How would you know he's there? He's the one. He's not going to come with it written on his forehead. I mean, that would be so easy that any duplicate would also have that. He's going to come in certain ways that truly people who are waiting for such an imam and who know such an imam, they are going to be the ones who will right away say labaik to him. They will say, we are at your service because you, we know you, we have been waiting for you. You're the one that we have been waiting for. See, so knowledge of what he is, who he is, and what he's about is necessary. That's what we are talking about in the second thing, that when we say we need to know who the Imam is, we need to know him well. So last uh, yesterday in the last episode, I mentioned 
regarding the fact that the, this Imam, unlike the other Imam, is going to be powerful, meaning that he will have power. He will be the ruler, he will be the emperor, the king, he will be the chief. No one can stand up to him. No one will be able to question him. He is beyond that. Everyone will have to bow down before his power. This is God's kingdom he's, in, he's establishing. He's not coming back to have an election or to have some sort of a democracy or a republic uh, or whatever. It, it, he's not coming back to do that and get the um, uh, a poll taken by the world and say, hey, do you all want this? He's not coming back to, to get our view. This kingdom is going to be Allah's kingdom on earth. Allah's promise is going to be established through this. And so when he comes back, he's not coming back to ask and to request people and to plead with them to join him. It's not going to work like that. When he comes back and he establishes the government and this rule is established, everyone will know what power is and we will know that he is the most powerful. He will be the superpower, the only superpower in the world. No one will be able to raise their eyes or anything towards him. So keep that in mind. Waiting for an imam like that, knowing that the imam is going to be like that, is going to be a test for everyone. Because everyone has in their view that uh, the imams are Muslim and, and, and they have been oppressed and they have been victimized. So there's a potential of us thinking that Imam Mahdi will be the same. And if we think that, it's going to be a problem for us in accepting the Imam, in knowing him, or even trying to be with him. So that's the first thing we have to look at. We got uh, some questions here of people who really want to know more about the subject. We got uh, Sar Faraz from New York, who's asking this question and saying that, can you give you another example? of how the Imam is going to be and what would be difficult. Okay, great, uh, in knowing him. So um, I will say that, why not? It, it's good for us to go through this, right? To know who the Imam is very well. So let me give you one more thing and it, it'll be good for you to think about it uh, on this uh, time because it's 15th of Shaban, it is his birthday. And around this time, it is good that we want to talk about uh, the Imam and we want to know him well and we want to know him deeply and it's great that you all are listening out there and it's great that uh, you know I mean you're asking questions and we are excited about that so uh, let me get to that questions let's let's, uh, let's look at another thing that the Imam is but before I go and answer that question one thing I should make clear I should make clear right is that for us to know the Imam, there are certain things that we also must have and need to work on. One of the things that we need to work on is how smart we are. We got to be smart, folks. We got to be smart. We can't be just like, you know, uh, tunnel visioned. We can't be like uh, narrow minded. We can't be simple minded. We can't be a honey boo boo, you know, like, like that anyone can take advantage of. This smartness and this, you can say, quick-wittedness, being quick-witted, you know that what that means? That means that's fast, shrewd, knowing things right away, understanding things right away, looking around us and you are able to decipher the situation and, and you are able to see what's going on around you right away. This is a street smartness that a believer should have and he should improve in. Because it is, you know, we have hadith regarding this. It says, Al-Mu'min Qayyis. Qayyis means a mu'min is very sharp. He is very sharp. He's not someone who just, you know, if you give him a puzzle, he's like lost. Or even if you give him something simple, it's hard for him to follow. The moment is someone who even if you give him complicated things, not only does he solve it, he looks right through it. And he's able to see what's happening. He's able to read between the lines. 
He's able to get your gestures and follow it. That's the sort of mindset that's necessary. So all of you out there who want to join the Imam, you got to be like that. In fact, when I read these signs and I understood these signs and I heard about these signs and, 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 and uh, what, a, uh, what we have to do in preparation for the Imam, that's the thing, no, that's the number one thing I understood is that, man, you need to be smart to know these type of things. How can you recognize this in that? You got to be smart, clever, really clever, intelligent, you, be, you have to be perceptive, knowing, I mean, really uh, able to identify a situation. Got to know that. Discerning, insightful, observant. You can use all these words and you can look it up. You can try to see how you can improve that. How you can improve your mind in that way. But that's the sort of person that's necessary to recognize the Imam. So keep that in mind. I just want to make that point. Um, for you all out there. Now, getting back to the question that he asked is about the Imam and what are some other things that make this Imam unique or that make him, that makes it difficult for us to recognize him. Well, one of the other things about the Imam that we need to be prepared for, that we have to get ready for, and it's going to be a sort of test also just like i told you about that the imam is the ruler this is another one and what is that and that this you know the imam who's coming back we have to be ready for an imam that has ilmul ghaib by ilmul ghaib you can say the knowledge of unseen complete knowledge he will, his intellect will be complete. Of course, all the Imams are complete. Of course, all the other Imams have knowledge, you know, but you'll see that the Imams, because of the fact that the people were not ready for it, they did not expose. They had to hold themselves back and sugarcoat many things when they talked to the people. They couldn't say anything openly to the people. Rasulullah couldn't say anything openly to the people. We have so many hadiths regarding Rasulullah where he held back from talking about many things that could be known from reality, from Ilmul Ghaib, that he had knowledge of, that Allah gave the knowledge to him, but he did not reveal it to the people because it wasn't prudent. Do that, people were not ready for it. I mean, look at Ghadir, the issue of Ghadir. You know, in the khutbah of Ghadir, when, when Rasulullah was giving the khutbah, you know, when it comes to the khutbah of Ghadir, everyone knows one line from it, and that's it. And it's an hour long khutbah, right? One hour long, and we just know one line from it. You ask any Shia, he'll say, Man kuntu maula fahada aliyun maula. But you know what? That sermon was a one hour sermon of people standing in the sun, you know? And, and in that sermon, you see that Rasulullah went into and, and, and almost divulged ilmul ghaib as he's talking. To the people, he almost divulged it. You know, I mean, he said, speaking about munafik, speaking about hypocrites, he said that I know, I know the hypocrites in this audience right now. I know the munafikin right here, they're standing before me. And I can name them for you. I mean, look at this. He is <laughs> divulging. I mean, he was very close to divulging ilmul ghaib. Knowledge that Allah had given him. That we don't know. It didn't come from any empirical science or knowledge, you know, or investigation or anything like that. It was informed to him by Allah. About munafikin, about hypocrites but people who are going to turn their backs on him and run away. People who are going to hijack his religion and they have plans and plots to do that. He spoke about it and everyone who was there pleaded with, pleaded with Rasulullah. They pleaded with the Prophet, please give us this knowledge. Please uh, share it with us. We want to know who they are. 
And Rasulullah, obviously knowing that discretion is the best part of valor, said no. Why? Because you are not ready for it. Are you ready for that? Are you prepared? Are you, do you know how to deal with that? So a lot of things in regards to ghaib, we're not told people because people are not ready. Now, as Shias and believers of Ahlul Bayt in our ideology and aqaid, we believe that Ahlul Bayt have ilmul ghaib. They are masoom and they have ilmul ghaib. Allah has informed them of what they need to know for their imamat. Of course, if they are Allah's representative, they cannot be in the dark. Allah has informed them of what they need to know. And they have access to that knowledge that they need to know in order to be the imam of the universe and to be the khalifa of Allah on earth. So when the imam knows, we know that it's the case, but the issue is that what does it mean? You see, what does it mean? That's where I want us all to now think about. Focus on this. What does that mean? I mean, yes, we say they have ilmul ghaib. Ask an Ishia, do the Imams have ilmul ghaib? Yeah, they have ilmul ghaib. What do you mean by that? Do you know what that means to you? It means that when we in our normal life deal with things, even Islam, when we practice Islam and the Shariat of Islam, it is not based on ilmul ghaib. It is based on ilmu shahadat, what is apparent in front of our eyes. Shahadat as opposed to ghaib. Ghaib means unknown, beyond what we see. And shahadat means what we can see, what is apparent to us, what is right in front of our eyes. So we base our shariat. We base the laws of Islam on what is apparent. In other words, when I see someone doing a sin, what I see is what I can judge on or why I can witness. I can't witness what's in the heart of the person. You know, what's in the heart of the person? I don't know what his intention was. I don't know what he intended. I don't know what his reasoning was. All I know is what I saw. You see, it's very important. That's how we live our life. That's how our logic works. Our logic works on what we see. Now, if someone comes to you and says, listen, you are an evil person. How do you know that? You can't see what's in my heart. He says, well, actually I can. You see, that's scary. Now, obviously, we are going to deny that. We're going to oppose that. We're going to say, no, you're wrong. You can't be. Why? Because really, What's in my heart is hidden away. And, and you know what? No one can see that. I don't, you know, I mean, we as a people, as human beings, do not think like that. Do not look at things like that. So when you say that Imam has ilmul ghaib, and when he comes, he's not acting on what's apparent. He's acting on what is not apparent. What is hidden and concealed away. It's not easy to deal with that. It's not easy to deal with that. Are we ready for such an Imam? Are we ready to accept an Imam who has Ilmul Ghaib and who's going to act on Ilmul Ghaib, who's going to carry out his government on Ilmul Ghaib? And not even not just Ilmul Ghaib, but complete knowledge. I mean, really complete knowledge. And this is where the problem is. Once we know that the Imam is like this, there's a problem in accepting such an Imam. It is my, it's true, my friends. You know, uh, I'll give examples, you know, no problem. You know, I mean, <laughs> don't, don't rush. I'm giving examples, right? So uh, hold on to your horses, right? We're going to get to that. And I have examples over here, you know, I mean, and right now the first, okay, fine. First example I'll give you, right? Why was Imam Ali left alone by the people? You know, he was left alone, meaning that no one would speak to him. He would be very, he was a very lonely person. 
Imam Ali was a very lonely person. It was hard for Imam Ali to find someone who would sit down with him for long. I mean, just to be together. I mean, a lot of people, you know, would be driven away, would just glide away from Imam Ali. They weren't really into him. He was the ruler. He was the Khalifa. And you would think that the Khalifa would have an entourage of people. You know, I mean, you know, you always have that around presidents and, and, and powerful figures. But Imam Ali wasn't like that. He would be walking down and people would be avoiding him. And do you know the reason that many people left him? Many people would leave him alone? One of the reasons is because of this aspect that Imam Ali had ilmul ghaib. And people had a hard time believing him. People have a hard time believing in Imam Ali. They, it was hard for them. You know, for example, they would ask him questions. He would be asked questions that are difficult. And he wouldn't even think about the answer. He would give it right away. He would give the answer right away without any hesitation. Any question you ask him, that was Imam Ali. Whenever you asked him a question, he would answer it without any hesitation. So, Omar, the second ruler after Abu Bakr, he told Imam Ali that why don't you take some time to think about the answer? You know, I mean, you don't need to say it right away. Why don't you just, why don't you take some time and then answer it? So Imam Ali told him, told Omar, that how many fingers do you have on your hand, on your right hand? He said, five. He says, why don't you hesitate to answer? He says, because it's clear, it's obvious. I have five fingers, I can see it. He says, just like your fingers and the amount of fingers on your hand are obvious for you, this universe is obvious for me. It's the same thing. Why do I need to hesitate to answer? To me, the answer to all of these things is very easy. So, Imam Ali has this complete knowledge that Allah gives the Imam of everything. So, whenever he's asked a question, he doesn't need to hesitate. He doesn't need to deliberate. He's not trying to find out. He's not trying to do research. You know, like we do. Every time we are asked a difficult question, we go to Google. You know? And you know what? If it's right or wrong, who knows? It's still on Google. But the fact is that Imam Ali truly is like that. If you look at him, he is he answers right away. So now it was hard for people to deal with that. It's difficult for people to deal with a person like that. For example, if Imam Ali is uh, going down with his army and he looks at a waterfall and says, you know, I can light up the city of Kufa with this waterfall. Imam Ali is saying that I can light up the city of Kufa with this water that's running. And the crowd around him, they're like, have a big laugh. Ha 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 ha. That's funny. You know, I mean, how can you deal with that? And they look at that and, you know, obviously even the closest people around Imam Ali had problems with what Imam Ali is saying a lot of times. They'd be like, you know, you know, I mean, really, do you want to say this to people? You know, it doesn't really make practical sense to say this to people. But you know what? It's hard, my friends. It's difficult. It really is difficult. Imam Ali was left alone. He would go to the well and speak into the well alone. He would say that there is a treasure of knowledge right here in my heart. I want to give it to someone, but no one is there to take it. No one is there to take it. Read Nahju Balagha. You see how Imam Ali is seeing and, 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 and really talking about his loneliness. That how people don't understand him. And such is the case with all the Imams. And will be the case with Imam Mahdi more so because now that Imam Mahdi is going to come, he is going to implement complete knowledge 
The whole earth is going to divulge its secrets to the Imams. The Imam is going to now take all those secrets and put it in practice and it will be hard for people to comprehend that. Imagine a court where you didn't need witnesses, nor lawyers, nor anything. You go to the Imam and the Imam will say he's guilty. But there's no witnesses, nothing. It's going to be a problem. People are going to have a problem, but where's the witnesses and all that? There's no need for witnesses in ghaib. What, in ghaib? You think there's witnesses needed? You think that Allah needs witnesses? Even though He will bring witnesses and you will be the first witness against you, meaning people will be the witness against themselves. But the fact is that that is reality. And so when the Imam will come back, his rule will be different and he will implement that complete knowledge, that unseen knowledge. The secrets of the earth will be divulged. That Imam will have that are we ready for such an Imam. Just to give you another example right now, look and see this strange and fantastic story that Allah mentions in the Quran regarding Musa and Qidr. You know the story, Surah Kahf, go and read it, Musa and Qidr. Most of you have heard it and Musa, uh, the Prophet of Allah, one of the five great Prophets of Allah, you know, highly intelligent, you know, uh, a complete human being and meets Qidr. And, and in that meeting, you see that Qidr He's acting on ilmul ghaib, on the knowledge of the unseen. And Musa, who is a very highly intellectual, being an ulul azm prophet means that not only does he have intelligence, he has knowledge, he has awareness, he, his heart is clean. He is one of the best human beings, that, I mean, around. And that person, Musa, is bewildered by Qidr. And he's saying he is protesting to Qidr. He could not handle what Qidr is doing. And Qidr is acting on Ilmul Ghaib. Allah, why did you even give this example in the Quran? What was the wisdom behind such an example or such a story in the Quran? I mean, it really goes against a lot of the stories of the Quran, you know. Not that it's against anything, but the fact is that it's so different. So different than everything else. It's more like a fantasy. More like this, you know, this tangent all of a sudden comes out. And so this amazing story, you see that, has been put there because Qidr acting on Ilmul Ghaib could not be tolerated by an Ulul Azam prophet. So if Musa cannot handle Qidr, then Qidr, who is going to be a side servant of Imam Mahdi, how are we going to handle Imam Mahdi? How are we going to deal with Imam Mahdi's knowledge and his implementation of his knowledge? That's the reason, my friends, we have to look at this and say, this is the marifat I need to have. Am I prepared for such an imam? Am I prepared for such an imam? And to give you something to work on on yourself, right? Really, people who are Im people who have one quality in them and they improve that one quality are able to truly handle this. And yes, people who are imaginative. The power of imagination that is inside of you that is what needs, that's what needs to be improved. This power of imagination that Allah has kept in us. Because logic does not go into unknown places. It's imagination that takes you into unknown places and makes you accept those things. Logic expertizes you in what's already there. It makes you an expert of the knowledge that's already there. But Imagination is what takes you beyond. A visionary, there's a difference between a visionary and a non-visionary. You know, people who are pragmatic and, log 
and all, only deal with logic and rationale, you see, they become experts of the knowledge that's, a, that's there right now. Experts in computers, experts in IT field, experts in this, experts in that. They're the ones who are experts in this. But you know, the people who actually discover the next layer of knowledge, the next stage of knowledge and information, it's always the visionaries. They think beyond their logic and go with their imagination and try to see what's out there. Really, those are the people that are going to do that. And we got to work on this. I'm out of time. And uh, I will go into this more next time when we come back from the next episode. I got to go, folks. And uh, we are out of time. And I, I pray for all of you. And I ask you all to pray for me. Uh, this has been Divine Allegiance. And I'm your host, Mona Beg. Until next time, Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.